But anyway, welcome. Uh, I am Patty Lucia. I'm the host of StoryBridge. Thank you for joining me this evening. Uh, a little bit about myself. I am a teacher. I'm a high school English teacher, and I've been a high school English teacher for many years. I'm an author. Um, I published a book last year, which is a collection of short stories, a memoir, Wildflowers and Present Tenses. And if you are interested in that or any of my services, uh, you can check out my website, uh, pattyluciawrites.com. And of course, I'm a storyteller. And I think that every human being is a storyteller. And this podcast is really about my, my interest and my passion for the power of story, which I think is, is everywhere. So at the beginning of the school year, when I am, uh, you know, I teach juniors and seniors in high school, uh, and I do teach language. You know, my the uh, the course that I teach is language based. So I begin by introducing the building blocks of our language, and which is really the, these are the building blocks of story. So if we're going to talk about the power of story, I think I need to start with the building blocks, right? So the building blocks are words. And I love to talk to my students at the beginning of the year about the power of words. Now, hundreds of years ago, when uh, you know our oral traditions were moving on to the written page, people felt so strongly that words in the compiling of words and the writing of words uh, were so powerful that they called it spelling. And that's why we call it spelling, because people really believed that words were so powerful that they cast spells. They could cast good spells, or they could cast bad spells. And that, frankly, is why we call it cursing because words do that too. So I, I like to share that with you at the beginning of the message. And I also wanted to start with that so that I can begin to talk about how powerful story is. So if words are that powerful, and people have written it, but this is no, you know, this is nothing new. Uh, Miguel Ruiz, who wrote The Four Agreements, talked about one of the agreements being be impeccable with your words. Why? Because they are that powerful. So if words are that powerful, the power of story is exponential. We don't really think about it, though. But story is really a part of our everyday lives. And it can, it can be a very powerful tool for good for healing, for expansion, for connection. And it can also be just as powerful a weapon. And we see that all the time too. So um, humans are natural storytellers. We, we go about our lives and we're living our lives. And at the same time we're living our lives, we're creating the story of our lives. What's interesting is often the story that we're creating about our lives is kind of different than the life that we're living, right? We're kind of, we do a lot of editing <laughs> along the way. So they don't always match. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about that today. But I wanted to just jump into a little bit of history. So storytellers uh, throughout history have been greatly revered uh, among indigenous people, um, it, the storytellers were the memory keepers, were the historians. And these uh, people were so held such a special power in their tribes and in their community that when the conquerors came, they often were most targeted. And how do I to conquer this? a people? Good. And it is important now to I am offering support erase the story so that you can impose your own. What? So the storytellers had to go. Yes. Um, that's how powerful storytellers and how revered storytellers so what is the have question been. You to ask me? 
particularly amongst um, indigenous people all over the world. Um, I wanted to share with you an indigenous teacher, Jamie Sands, she wrote, and she wrote this poem and I just thought it was so oh, moving and I, I wanted to share it with you. She says, sing to me, O ancient, ancient one, that I may see in my mind the love on every face and every spirit that came before, the medicine that they made, the sacred tradition they passed to me so the memory will not fade. O oh, storyteller, be my bridge to those other times so I may walk in beauty with the ancient rhythm and rhyme. And I just thought that was so beautiful. I wanted to share it with you and it was so appropriate for what, for what I'm sharing with you guys this, this evening. So in contemporary times, the power of the story is everywhere. And, and, and it's not really called story, it's called narratives, right? So narratives, we have the global narrative, we have the, the power of narratives in companies and so forth. And what we don't realize is that um, often it's the power of story that sells us stuff. Like if you've ever bought a house, often the moment that you decide to buy that house is the moment you begin to create the story in your mind of you living in that house and raising children in that house. You start seeing you in this story, in the kitchen, <laughs> in, you know, in the bath, in the backyard. The story begins to play out. And once you have that story, it is perhaps the story that sells you the house. And you could say the same thing about the car. And we've seen this play out in movies and in other stories where the savvy salesman will plant the seed of a story. And once that story begins to take hold in the potential buyer's mind, them driving that car, driving the car with their girlfriend, having that kind of story in their mind, the car is sold. The right narrative can also, and I won't say the right narrative, I will say that it is often stories that move a whole nation to go to war. So if a story is told over and over again, you can get a whole nation to pick up arms. In fact, every genocide that has, has ever happened has involved a story that was told over and over again until it expanded among the people and the people began to tell that story and they believed that story and then they acted on that story. And the story was usually about humans that were made to be less than humans or perhaps not humans at all. And once the story was told enough and the people believed it, they acted upon it. So that's the dark, deep, shadowy side of the power of story. So story can be used for good and it can be used for evil, but it is extremely powerful. And I think that's a lot of what I wanted to share with you. I'm interested in the use of story and the power of story to tell stories of love in all its forms. Stories of forgiveness, acceptance, gratitude, stories that can heal, stories that can nurture. Those are the kinds of stories that I would like to nurture here and share. So in our personal lives, when we're telling our stories, there is an element of a shadow side that we don't like to tell, and that is often the gap. So for instance, we're living our life, we're having our thoughts, we're having these experiences, and the story that we tell is kind of the cleaned up version is the story that is the most acceptable story, the story that may present us as a good person, as an acceptable person, as a person who is um, going to be approved of. And, you know, I've thought a lot about this. And when I was in, and I thought a lot about this when I was writing my memoir. So last year I wrote a memoir with a collection of short stories and I found myself 
saying, how can I tell my story honestly? How much of my shadow side do I really want to write? So Hemingway once said, good stories begin with one honest sentence. And I really believe that. And when you think about it, that's a challenge. You know, that one honest sentence that can anchor a story and begin it. How do you get there? How do you get to the one honest sentence that you're going to tell or you're going to write? Margaret Atwood once said, if you want to write <laughs> a really honest, real story, you have to write as if no one is ever going to read it. <laughs> you just have to pretend no one's going to read this, right? And that allows those shadowy aspects of yourself to get a little bit more comfortable and maybe want to appear on the page. I think about this a lot, about the shadowy side of us. And I think that the shadow side of our stories is also is, is just as important. So I don't want uh, people to think that when they're sharing stories here, they can't share their shadow side. So I had this experience. I teach teen teenagers, and recently I had this experience. One of the jobs I have, I, I work with elementary school children, uh, teaching them nutrition and cooking, right? So I go in, and sometimes we ask them interesting icebreaker questions. And I was thrilled that we there was a question recently that I thought was really interesting. So these were second graders. And the question was, if you were in a story, would you want to be the hero? Or would you want to be the villain? These are second graders. Now, second graders don't have as much filter as we do. So you can guess what they were saying mostly. <laughs> and of course, the teacher, uh, the assistant, was standing on the side kind of wanting to edit <laughs> the children were saying, because mostly they were saying, I want to be the villain. I want to be the villain. Because, you know, then I can do what I want. And one little girl said, I want to be the villain because I don't want to save people. I don't want to save people. <laughs> um, and then you had a couple of students who clearly were, had one eye on the teacher who kind of said, I want to be the hero because I want to save people. You know, and you could tell already they were thinking, well, I want to be approved of. I want my story. I want, you know, I want approval of my teeth from my teacher and whatever. Why would I say I want to be a, vic a villain, right? But that is very much our story. Uh, my high school students recently, we were talking about their favorite movies, right? Um, and... It turns out that for most of my students, their favorite movies are psychological thrillers or psychological horror movies. And I was asking them, why? Why are those kind of movies? And they really, the way that I, they articulated it was because I get to think about like what I would do in that situation. So basically they can play out their shadowy ideas and thoughts and desires and everything through these, these, crazy, these crazy movies. And I think how often uh, so much of that goes on is we get to watch our shadow sides be expressed through others. And the reason why I, I think about this a lot is because I also look around our world and I wonder, I just wonder, I don't have the answer. I'm not a sociologist, I'm not a psychologist, I'm a storyteller. And I often wonder if humans could express their stories in a more whole way. In other words, if they felt they could tell their stories and include also the shadowy aspects of their stories, would we have less of an expression of those shadows in violent ways in our world? If we could give expression to that in our stories, would there be less pressure in the collective for outbursts 
shadowy outbursts in the collective and in our world? I don't know the answer to that, but it is a question I ask and wonder, can store, you know, is this another way that story could be a powerful healing tool if people were more free to tell their personal stories and include more shadow in them. So that is really the purpose um, of this podcast is to tell stories that build bridges to our hero selves, to our villain selves, and to heal and to tell stories about love in all its, its forms, acceptance, forgiveness, gratitude. Uh, and that's really, in my hope is that we can, in the process of celebrating our wholeness, we can create a collective story that can participate in healing the world. It's kind of a grander vision, right? But I like grand visions myself. So the way this podcast works is I have looked at the national commemorative days and the international commemorative days. And there are just endless possibilities for stories. And so I look at every month and I looked at May and there's a list of, of stories, um, that, a list of topics. And that is something that I kind of wanted to use those as a springboard every month for stories. My stories, your stories, all kinds of stories. People can share their stories in all kinds of, of ways. Uh, and, and that's really uh, my, my purpose. That's really kind of the vision of this podcast. So before I jump into the topics of May, um, would anyone like to jump in here? So, and you have any comments or questions before I jump into the May topics? I just wanted to say that it's a very captivating um, concept that you have there. I found myself being drawn into every single thing that you were saying and never looked at stories from the perspective of the shadow. So I mm -hmm. think that's a really nice topic. Mm, I just you. wanted to compliment you on that. It sounds very yeah. interesting. Thank you. Yeah, You're thank welcome. you. I and I just, you know, uh, Patty, my wheels were spinning, as you said before. It, it was fascinating to me what you were mm -hmm. saying about words. In, in Kabbalah, which is a Jewish mysticism, yes. they mm -hmm. actually say in the Zohar that harsh words can be the cause of airborne illnesses, which wow. was, blows my mind these days. Yeah. Mm. kind of makes you wonder about yeah. what's happening in the world today <laughs> correct <laughs> talk about the power of words yes well then the awesome. opposite the opposite must be true yes so then the cure could the cure be right could mm -hmm. be love and has always been love and loving words and words mm -hmm. and stories that um, tell a story um, of, of love in all of its forms. And mm -hmm. so how wonderful is that? Healing on all levels, basically. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Rose. Um, does, does anyone else want to jump in here before I jump into that? Yes, Danny. I had a comment. Um, and exactly what Lisa said, you, you've just drawn us in. But I think what we're lacking or we've lacked in society, at least I know from my personal experience, is we've become so busy with outside of ourselves that you, this used to be a normal thing of people getting together and, and um, you know, sharing stories, women, you know, in the kitchen, working together in community kitchens and, and sharing their stories. And, and it's, it's been a lost art. So um, I just think it's, it's a, an incredible uh, vision that you've come up with to do something like, like this podcast. Just amazing because it does. It, it, it just brings um, that sense of community back together. Mm. And uh, that's where healing takes place, Absolutely. you know. 
Yeah. Oh, thank you so much for that. You know, Danny, I um, used to, I, I had stepped away from teaching for about 10 years and I had a cafe. It's a coffee house cafe. Now, coffee houses are are beautiful um, mm -hmm. gathering places, a place places where people um, tell stories. And as a matter of fact, so powerful are the gatherings at coffee houses that in places in countries that where the the people in power feared revolution, they often outlawed coffee houses because of the power of people connecting and telling stories that were that were revolutionary in a way, right? I used to have a little stool by the table in the kitchen and every day someone would want to sit in the kitchen while we shared stories and you know the stories of our lives or the dream we had last night or whatever. Um, I agree. I think um, often sharing of food and sharing of stories, I don't think it gets any better than that. <laughs> in my opinion so um yes yes i agree and actually the most magical night at my coffee house was open mic night which was a night where people come together they share their stories through poetry story music and so forth so magical magical so i would love to share these topics and a few words on the topics for may if you guys sure. would like okay yeah now, go ahead all right now there are so many topics i couldn't really do them all we'd, we'd need the whole year to get through one month's worth of uh, topics but um i picked ones that i thought to be honest with you i picked ones that i thought we could have the most fun with here are the topics and i've shared this with some of you already know this but let me just share the topics. so motherhood of course we have mother's day in in may work, naked gardening, laughter, donuts. That's a personal favorite. Living together in peace, apple pie, bees, riding your bike to work, turtles, redheads, one of my all-time favorites, and rescuing a dog. So those are the topics that I plan on playing with the month of May. And then when we get into June, there's a whole other list of topics for us to play with. So I wanted to just share a few words um, about on some of these topics. And then I really want to open it up and see if you guys have uh, stories to share on any of these. So I actually think May is such a wonderful month. Spring is in full bloom. You have new life that's being created all around us. It's the perfect month to commemorate mothers when you think about it. We have human mothers, animal mothers, motherlands, Mother Earth, um, even mother ships if you want to go a little further out. Um, so the theme of motherhood runs through the month of May. M uh, so motherhood is literally in the air in the seeds that are carried in the wind, in the pollen, in the sounds of mothers and children in parks uh, and playgrounds, mother ducks and mother birds um, instructing their young, the fragrance of the flowers, uh, the baby mangoes that are hanging in the trees. The dirt is, is soft and fertile again, and the worms are happy. Um, the grass has come back in the northern regions. There's so much life so much creation. So it's literally Mother Earth on display. And what a wonderful, perfect month to commemorate mothers of all, you know, of all living things. So I, I love that uh, Mother's Day, um, which was just yesterday, is celebrated in May. Uh, we have naked gardening. Now that's May 5th. It's already passed. When I think about naked gardening, I think about Adam and Eve. I'm not sure if that's my Christian upbringing. And I also think about the Joni Mitchell song, Woodstock, when she sings, uh, we've got to get back to the garden. There's something uh, really primal and wonderful and freeing about the thought of naked gardening. I personally have not gardened naked. I think I'm going to put it on my bucket list, to be honest with you. There's laughter. Laughter was also May 5th, so the National Day of Laughter. 
And here I think of levity, lifting the spirits, raising one's vibration. You know, we spiritual folks, we work so hard to raise our vibration that sometimes we get way too serious about it. And I've thought maybe we get so serious about raising our vibration that we kind of lower it because we're so damn serious. <laughs> so it might be, ironically, that we would raise our vibration so much more if we laughed at even a crass or dirty joke. You know, maybe that would do more to raise our vibration than, you know, meditating for three hours. I'm not sure, but I just sometimes... I just kind of wonder about that. National Donut Day. I love this. So now donuts are often associated with policemen. You know, you have that that vision of the policemen and the donuts and so forth. I think of fresh donuts outside of, you know, Krispy Kreme and waiting in line for the new batch of donuts. But I have a personal story about donuts. Now, way back when I was born, uh, there were no cell phones right? And on the day that I was born, in the morning, after my father had left for work, he was a painter, so he was out going off to paint houses, right? He had left for work, and my mother's water broke. And she needed to reach my father. She knew, though, that on his way to work, he stopped at the local donut shop for a donut and a cup of coffee. The donut shops at that time were the gathering places, right? It's where <laughs> folks stopped on their way to work, had that coffee, that donut, checked in with their neighbors, shared a little gossip. And it was, the, she was able to call the donut shop, have the donut shop owner hand the phone to my father so my father could get the news that he was about to have his second born child. So he, my father got the news of my arrival or on my, my imminent arrival in a donut shop. So I'm, I'm very fond of donut shops. National Apple Pie Day is May 13th, which is just in a couple of days. And people think about apple pie. And this is, I, I love that. First of all, we think that uh, apple pie is American, quint quintessentially American, but actually apple pies began in England. And apple pies didn't really come along until after we had grown enough apple trees in America to make apple pies. We didn't, we, the kinds of apples we had in America when the settlers first came were those crab apple variety. And believe me, they don't make, they don't make good apple pies, right? So, um, and when we started growing apple trees in America, the mostly what we used it for was cider. Now, if I was an early settler, I'd be drinking my share of cider too, because, you know, those conditions were rough. So I'd be, you know, I'd be in the cider. I'm sure I'd be in the cider. But uh, that, that story of Johnny Appleseed, that was a real guy who kind of it took, made it his business to spread apple seeds everywhere. And after a while, we had thousands of varieties of apples. And some of those apples made really good apple pie. It wasn't until World War II, when there were some GIs that were interviewed by journalists who asked something like, what are you fighting for, boys? And they said, mom and apple pie. So that's how apple pie became so uh, American. I actually think that more accurately, they were probably saying mom and mom's apple pie. <laughs> I think it was probably all, all, about, all about mom. Um, and I just have a few words to say about bees. I, I love bees. I one of my favorite books is The Secret Life of Bees by Sue Monk. It's a wonderful, wonderful <laughs> book. But you guys probably know this. When Einstein said, the way the bees go, so do humans. You know, and so we've been, there have been the reports of di disappearing bees, right? The bee populations, and it's caused a lot of panic. But bees are these incredible, magical little life forms. They create these perfectly geometrical containers for the honey they make in store without the use of any sophisticated tools right? <laughs> like we use. And they live and they die for their queen, but they serve earth. 
because in a single bee's life, they pollinate 2,600 plants in a single lifetime. Wow. But they, they only produce one twelfth of a teaspoon of honey. So is serving the queen really serving Mother Earth after all? And I love how honey is like this magical elixir. So it's talked about in the Bible as medicine or the symbol uh, for the abundance in God's gift of sweetness to his people. How are bees able, I wonder, to create, to make such a holy elixir? Is it the perfection of those geometrical cones? Is it the perfect vibrational sound in which they bathe the honey? Does the very buzz of bees carry some secret universal harmonic quality? And while humans think we are the only ones who can communicate with the creator, maybe it's the bees who have more of a direct line. I wonder about this because I've often noticed that beekeepers are a special kind of human. If you've ever met, and they've been written about in books, Sue Monk's book, The Secret Life of Bees, those sisters who were beekeepers were absolutely magical women. And uh, Fanny Flags, uh, fried green tomatoes at the Whistle Stop Cafe, Iggy was a magical, wonderful being who also was called a bee charmer. So does the creator hand pick the people who overlook these holy little creatures? These are some of the things that I wonder and am in awe about when it comes to bees. I think I'm going to leave it there. There's more to say. There's riding our bike to work. Um, there are redheads. There are rescuing dogs. But I really just wanted to kind of wet our whistle a little bit on some of these topics and see if any of you would like to share a story on any of these topics, a little anecdote, a story. I would. Um, where bees are concerned, sorry, I have music playing. I remember as a child, um, I got stung in the center of my hand by a bee. And as a little girl, I've always been attracted to flowers and plants and anything green, basically. Mm. And I got away from my mom that day and I was playing with um, an asparagus fern and the fern had on flowers and the flowers turned to red berries and then the bees come around and pollinate the flowers. And I just sat there and I remember clearly just holding my hand out and the bee lit on my hand and it walked to the center of my hand. And it's when I made the fist, it's when it, it actually stung me. Mm. And of course I screamed and everything and they pulled out the stinger and all of that. Everything else is a blur. But as I got older, I always remembered, um, well, I'm from the Caribbean, so we have a lot of snow cone carts where these guys on bicycles will have shaved ice yes. and you just squirt some kind of like red sweet dye that the bees just love and every time I go to town and I walk along the street even though there's no snow cone carts I've had experiences where bees come and light on my hand and they crawl all the way up to one of them crawled on my shoulder and I've always wondered the significance, like, is it that your vibration and, you know, what you give off, is it something that attracts bees to you? And bees are only attracted to certain types of people. So I have yes. been told and I have I've had many instances where bees have just randomly come and light on me. And the first trip I had to Toronto in 2014 or 2013, I was in Long Branch and I was talking to these two gentlemen outside of a roti shop and one of them said, oh my goodness, don't move. And I said, oh, what? And I, you know, he says, no, 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 don't move, don't scream. You have a bee on your forehead and he's crawling on your hairline. And you know, the bee came all the way down to my nose and the guy was like, just don't move. And he just flicked it and it went away. And he says, oh, he says, you're one of a kind, the bees like you. <laughs> and, 
you know, so I've always wondered about, you know, our vibrational energy and if it's something that attracts um, certain people or certain animals, certain insects to us and what is the meaning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. What yeah. is, what is our connection? What do they sense? Because bees are all about vibration. So if they're around you, it, it's about vibration. And uh, I, I find, I, I love stories like that. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. Have you ever thought of being a beekeeper? Um, it's funny because we have a beekeeper back home in Barbados and he came to my house twice. And it was in 2007, we had like this whole, my mother just saw this brown clump of bees on our guard wall one day randomly. And she called me and she says, I have a bunch of bees on the wall. I'm going to have to call Mr. Gibson. And he came over and removed them. And the funny thing is, is that as he was removing the bees and he got them all, you know, in this container and stuff and everything just died down, we had an earthquake, <gasps> right? So he said to my mom, he says, oh, that makes sense now because the queen was on our guard wall and the whole hive followed and they were running from the earthquake. And my mom and this gentleman was outside and he stood the whole day at my house. And, you know, when I came home, I was totally fascinated because he, he actually gave us like a huge piece of honeycomb and the honeycomb, I made this comment and I said, is that dirt in the honeycomb? Like, why is it so dark? You know, and he laughed and he said, he started talking about, you know, honey and how it's made. And I got interested and he says, you know what? I train beekeepers every year. Why don't you come and learn? And I said, I don't know if I could take all those bees all over me and, and crawling and stuff, you know, and I, I never took him up on it. But he says, I think you'd be quite good at it. And I was like, oh, no, come on. <laughs> mm. how, yeah. long, how, how long ago was that, Lisa? That was in 2007 when we had that, um, that earthquake. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah, it was just a slight tremor, but mm. he said it's really interesting because the bees pick up the vibrations of the earth as well. Absolutely. Whatever is going on in the earth, he says, always, always pay attention to bees. He says, when you see a swarm of bees going that way, he says, stop and wonder why. Because mm. bees know when natural disaster is going to happen. They know when a hurricane is coming and they clear out, right? Mm. They all clear out and they go somewhere else where it's going to be safe. If bees are, they, they also nest on the ground. Bees don't necessarily nest in trees as we see them. They nest in everything. They nest in buildings. Um, they nest in pieces of wood. They, uh, we had a whole bunch of bees underneath a huge boulder that was in front of our house. And when they moved the boulder, it was like three beehives were underneath there, right? So they disturbed all these bees and it was chaos. <laughs> but he says he's always said that and this is the third time I've met him in my lifetime I met him when I was really young and he said the bees in Barbados they were leaving certain spots in certain parishes for whatever reason and that year we had a lot of flooding and a lot of those bees lived like maybe low down to the ground and they knew that that year that they must pack up and leave right wow. so he's he's always analyzing bee behavior and then trying to correlate you know okay what is going to happen around here you know because the bees are acting strange mm -hmm. and when they don't make enough honey as well that's also significant mm -hmm. i'm not sure how significant it is but it is mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. yeah well because something is interfering with their vibration yeah maybe yeah they know something is happening and yes. bees get stressed and they also respond to stress as well. Mm. And it's just like if you're in your garden and you have a bee that comes around you and you get stressed and you swat the bee, then the bee gets annoyed and then it wants to attack you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. It's really, um, what a, what a great story. I, I honestly think that, um, you would probably be a wonderful beekeeper and if you, i think so too <laughs> and if you if you ever if you ever decide to be a beekeeper i would love to have the honey that is produced in the beehives that you care for deal yeah i would, I would love because 
you know, because the, the beekeeper is also, if, if there's a real harmonic relationship between the bees mm -hmm. and the beekeeper, all the better honey. <laughs> I believe so too. <laughs> well, you'll have to keep us posted on that because I, I will. will be, I would be. I'd be a. I'd be a customer for sure. <laughs> so thank I'll you. I'll keep that in yeah. mind. <laughs> thank you for sharing, Lisa. That was wonderful. Uh, does would anyone else like to share? Anyone else have a um, a, a story to share on any of these topics? Any I'm going to share a little yeah. story actually that. Um, I was thinking about your podcast over the, the last two days that um, you had sent out the uh, message. And I was asking spirit to um, bring forth a story, especially about Mother's Day. Mm -hmm. And uh, this one uh, story comes to mind. Um, I'd graduated, I was working in my dad's dental office. And um, this one afternoon, my mom was kind of the office manager. and. She had booked the afternoon off and she said, oh, Danae, you need to drive me to the airport, which was about a half an hour away. That's why I, I booked your patients off. So I'm like, OK, um, you know, I'm going to head home from work and, and get changed and I'll come by and, and pick you up. And um, so my mom was actually, I was taking her car so that I could then drive back. So mom picked me up in front of my place and I changed into, you know, shorts and a tank top kind of thing. And I thought, oh, you know, it's a hot afternoon. I'll come back and I can lay out in the sun once I drop mama off at the airport. So I come down to the car and my mom says, you're not driving me to the airport looking like that. Here I was 22 years of age and I'm like, what? <laughs> My mom's telling me at 22 what I can and can't wear to drive her to the airport. How dare her? So she said, you need to go back upstairs and change into something more decent and, and uh, agreeable. So I puffed back upstairs and I got changed and I came back down and I was I was pissed. I was so mad. I thought, mom, I can't believe you're making me do this. I'm just driving you to the airport. What the heck? So I get in on the passenger side because my mom drove um, to the airport and I was just in a grumpy mood. It just, it, it just ticked me off like, like none other. So then she said to me about 10 minutes into the drive, she said, well, just so that you're not mad at me for the rest of the trip to the airport, I need you to look in my purse. And I looked in her purse and I pulled out this package or this ticket. And she said, well, open it up. And so I opened it up and it was my class, my university class. Um, I was going to be married um, in August. I think this was like in May or June or something like that. My university class had put together money to fly me down to Vancouver. And then my girlfriend, we were the only two Canadians in university at the University of Washington. She picked me up at the airport and we drove down to Seattle for a bridal shower, like a surprise bridal shower. So it was actually me that was getting onto the airplane. So when I opened the thing and I read this, that this was a gift from my class, oh my God, the tears started flowing. Mm -hmm. I couldn't stop crying. I'm like, oh. <laughs> I can't believe my family kept this secret from me for all this time. Obviously, my mom was in on it. And uh, yeah, the whole the, the plane ride from Trail, BC, which is my hometown to Vancouver, BC, was about 45 minutes. And I think I cried the whole time that I was on the plane. <laughs> they were happy tears. But um, yeah, I mean, but the funniest part, too, is my mom packed the suitcase of clothes that I was to wear for the weekend. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> you definitely had way different tastes in clothing styles. There's no <laughs> doubt. It was to the point where, well, my, my best friends and my classmates in university, one of them was like four foot 11 and I'm five, seven. So I could never fit into her clothes. So I had to put up with the clothes that my mom had packed <laughs> me, but 
Yeah, you know, it's it's so funny how situations like that can happen, and uh, you're so grumpy and and mad at this at the at the moment, and then not realizing that's a you know what unfolded the blossom kind of that that mm-hmm. unfolded in the package that mm-hmm. unfolded. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that was uh, that was my story that Spirit had asked me to to share, and I had totally mm-hmm. forgot about it. It was it was funny. I totally forgot about it. And uh, yeah, that I just remembered this morning. So yeah, it's, it's amazing what mothers can do. (laughs) Well, yes. And also she was willing, um, at least for a short period of time to be the absolute bad guy. So she could get the job done Done. (laughs) on that plane. Yes. So she didn't want to be in, uh, in short jean cutoffs or anything in a tank top on the plane or flying to Vancouver yeah, so. <laughs> for, for a shower yeah yeah <laughs> yeah. So, yeah yeah so you probably would have been very cold <laughs> yeah <laughs> absolutely absolutely yeah well, yeah thank you so much that was a sweet story <laughs> <laughs> all right well this has been an absolute uh, pleasure and I really do appreciate you guys being here um, and being a part of the story magic this evening and the power of story. I feel touched by the stories and the interactions and feel that this has been a blessing for me. I hope it's been a blessing for you as well. So thank you so much, all of you, for uh, making this launch a real joy. 